How did Harold Godwinson become king? This is probably the justification that William of Normandy used for his campaign against the Saxons, which led to a devastating end for the, the Anglo-Saxons and their way of life. That's all coming up. In order to understand how Harold Godwinson became king, we need to rewind a bit here. We need to go back to the time when the Vikings were invading and raiding England and King um, Edward the Confessor realises he's in danger and he needs to flee to France for, um, for safekeeping and, and safe passage. Edward the Confessor is hosted by the Normans. Now, obviously, hosting someone of, of a royalty kind of status would have been a very expensive proposition. And the Normans, I think, justifiably, would have expected something out of that. Uh, and I think, given that Edward the Confessor didn't have any children of his own, it's fairly obvious that he promised the throne to William. And we've already talked about this a bit in a different video, but in, essentially, it wasn't exclusively Edward the Confessor's throne to give away. In other words, just because you were nominated by a, a king or a member of the royal family doesn't necessarily guarantee your succession to the throne. You have to be uh, elected by the Witten and you need to be able to demonstrate uh, kingly kind of acts, that is to say statesmanship and military leadership. So the Witten needs to be convinced. Now, I don't believe that the Witten would have uh, elected um, Duke William because of his reputation as such a brutal leader. However, Edward the Confessor essentially negotiates his return to the throne at the end of King Canute's reign. In that phase, uh, Earl Godwin had now risen to power, that is to say Harold Godwinson's father. He had risen from a very sort of junior status and position to uh, a very senior member of the Witten and a very senior Earl under King Canute. He was essentially King Canute's right hand man and had himself apparently been um, involved in some acts of treachery against other Saxons. During the reign of Edward the Confessor, Harold Godwinson rises and rises and rises through the power ranks himself um, and after his father dies he becomes, I guess, a very powerful Earl. He is an absolute tactician of his day. He knows and understands the flow of a battle. He can predict how the enemy is going to work and move. He's a very effective statesman. He's able to negotiate with other Earls. He's able to negotiate through rebellion, to deal with rebellion. So this is very much a man of the people. He's also very much uh, an established military leader. Harold Godwinson has also put country before family, so his brother, Earl Tostig, doubled the taxes in Northumbria. Now, that obviously didn't go down well with the other people. To be fair, um, Earl Tostig only raised the taxes to the same as everywhere else in the country, but um, the, the populace felt that such a, a, a massive increase in taxation was unfair and a rebellion ensued. To settle the deal, Harold Godwinson decides to kick his own brother out of the country, strip him of his titles and send him away. Uh, Tostic uh, very much becomes an angry man over this one and um, raids and harries um, on his way out of the country and seeks to return to the country uh, as soon as he possibly can 
negotiating with at least two, if not three, uh, foreign leaders to try and raise a, uh, an army and gain support for an invasion. According to Norman sources, uh, Edward the Confessor has promised uh, William, Duke of Normandy, the crown. Now, we don't know if that's entirely true, correct, but certainly circumstantially, it proves um, it's, it's very plausible and very likely. Um, and as I say, the, the Normans would have expected something in return for their hospitality of Edward the Confessor. So I think that's uh, a fair kind of call. Harold Godwinson, I think, very much followed the line of the king and all the, the choices of the country and the nation um, and showed himself to be a very true to, um, to the needs of the country. Both his father and also Harold Godwinson himself very much consolidated their power bases. Uh, to be fair, they did in fact stack the Witten with family, friends and people who were going to be sympathetic to their cause. So it's, it's not necessarily very fair to say that uh, there was a lot of impartiality going on. Now if you look at who were the other kind of possibilities, well Harold Godwinson himself, whilst Earl had been sent into Europe to pick up a um, and take to England someone to um, to replace Edward the Confessor. However, they died on their way to England, so that didn't work out. Um, there were a number of other uh, foreign rulers in Denmark, in Norway, obviously um, Normandy, but also Flanders and so on as well, who all were eyeing the crown. Um, and despite at least two that I, uh, I can think of, who probably would have been eyeing the crown from England itself. Obviously, Harold Godwinson being one of them. Now, of course, you did also have Edgar the Atheling. He was a very young royal, but very quiet in court. There's nothing really recorded much about him. Um, so he's a difficult one to really read and understand. He had no power base. He was too young for that. He had no experience in battle. He was too young for that. He had no kind of experience in statesmanship, so I don't really see that, that he would have been very much of a choice to give the crown to. Uh, it's not to say that young monarchs have ever necessarily been completely ineffective, that's not true at all, but certainly on the face of it, he really wouldn't have been a great contributor to the um, overall success of the Saxon people, or well, the English people we really should call them, given that so many uh, Scandinavians had migrated into England and become part of the kind of English nation. Uh, I certainly don't think that um, we should call them entirely Saxons at all at this stage. So in other words, to be a monarch, to, to become a monarch in the Saxon sort of world, you needed to have a bloodline into the royal family. You had to have noble blood. You needed to be nominated by the monarch and you also needed to be uh, elected by the Witan. Now, if we look at the three main contenders here, we've got Harold Godwinson, you've got Harold Hadrada, and you have William of Newman, uh, Normandy. William of Normandy had a questionable bloodline. I don't necessarily think it was that strong at all, given that he wasn't a legitimate son. Um, he, was the, he was the product of an affair, basically. So, and really only one or two generations later, um, he would never have become the, uh, a duke in France. They really preferred to have direct, pure bloodlines. So, um, as it was in those circumstances at that time, he did. He, I don't believe, would have been electable by the Witan, given his reputation for brutal leadership. Was he nominated by the Edward the Confessor? Possibly. So, let's take a look at um, Harold Hadrada. Noble blood? Yes. Um, nominated by the King? No. Electable? Possibly. Um, we don't really know. Now, as I say, there's 
other alternatives from Flanders and Denmark, but uh, we won't go into those too much. We've got Harold Godwinson. So, was he noble? No, he wasn't. Or um, was he uh, nominated by the king? Yes, he was, and we do know that. In fact, we have um, independent, I guess, um, sources who say that, who, who were witness to the event at the time. That is to say, uh, Edward the Confessor's steward and also the Archbishop of Canterbury both witnessed this. Uh, this wasn't just like a, a deathbed confession or, or, sorry, a deathbed nomination. This was um, something done in front of other people, so it was um, very much understandable. Would, he, would uh, Harold Godwinson have been electable by the Witan? Absolutely, and he was. So, um, and he was a very strongly electable person. I don't think there was really any other major candidates. Now we do know, um, I don't think there were any other major candidates as strong as Howard Godwinson in England at the time. Now we do know that uh, the Earl of um, Mercia was very much eyeing up the throne, but um, that didn't work out for him. And that's possibly why uh, his troops didn't arrive as quickly as perhaps um, uh, as, as perhaps promised uh, to Hastings, but that's another story. Interestingly, there is debate among the different Anglo-Saxon chronicles. So if we have a look at this book, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, this is a, an amalgamation of the five existing Anglo-Saxon chronicles that we have. In several of those versions, it refers to Harold Godwinson as, as regent, not king. It's only in the E version of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is Harold Godwinson referred to as king. It's very interesting because it, it leads some support to some of the Norman claims. It's really difficult to understand that in the context that it's provided because the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is not written for future historians or kind of, you know, people who are interested in Saxon history a thousand years later. <laughs> um, what then happens with Harold becoming king? Well, we'll talk about the coronation in a different video, but essentially all the earls and the major power base of England is drawn to London because Edward the Confessor dies. Days later, his funeral occurs and he's uh, essentially put to rest. Harold Godwinson takes the opportunity and is coronated on the same day. This is almost unheard of. And on one side, you would think that this is Harold grasping an opportunity to consolidate and finalize his ascent to the throne. On the other hand, you need to understand that this is winter, uh, it, travel is difficult, and the, the English earls are from far and wide, so many of them would probably only come together several times a year. So here was an opportunity to have the coronation. Everyone's here, we may as well do it all in one day. That's the Godwinson version. The other version, of course, is, uh, you know, a bit kind of suspicious, perhaps, that Harold is rushing this through because ordinarily a coronation may not occur for weeks in the Saxon period or possibly even uh, months, depending on the circumstances and the time. So, Harold rapidly becomes king. William, Duke of Normandy, now, he had many people in power throughout England. So, because the Normans had hosted Edward the Confessor, they were able to use their influence to insert Normans into key positions around the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, essentially as modern-day diplomats, or you could perhaps suggest they were spying on the Saxons. And I don't necessarily think that's untrue because these people were reporting back to William of Normandy. So Harold becomes king. It would probably take someone a day, possibly two, to get to the English coast. It would possibly take them a day or two to get across the channel and maybe three days 
to find William of Normandy. So what are we talking here? Uh, seven or eight days, I guess at most. We'll talk about William's response to the coronation uh, in more detail, but we know William uh, was furious. He was inconsolable for an hour or so, and then he called a council of war. Uh, a skeptic may suggest that William was simply waiting for an opportunity, and here it was. But uh, certainly from the Norman understanding of what had happened, uh, the Saxons had reneged on their promises and stolen from William his opportunity to become king. What happens next? Well, within months, William of Normandy is raising an army unlike any seen before. This is a phenomenal army, a massive capability. Building a fleet of ships of uh, numbers, again, unseen in Normandy. And creating plans to invade England, which of, of course culminates later that year. Alright guys, thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video.